Welcome to Transformative Partnership, Digital Scholarship Services at the University of Michigan for the Summer 2022 CNI Project Updates. I am Anne Conquin. I am the Digital Scholarship Strategist at the University of Michigan Library. And I'm Joe Bauer, and I'm with the College of Literature, Science, and Arts Technology Services team, and I'm a Digital Scholarship Research Consultant. There we go. If you want to follow along with us or uh, click on any of the links from this uh, slide deck, here's the, uh, the link to do that. You can just pause the video and grab that and follow along. All right, this is our agenda for this presentation. Um, we'll start first with some acknowledgments as we do for all of our workshops and presentations. Um, and then we'll go through the context and overview of this digital scholarship uh, service. Um, we'll do a recap of what we have presented at the last um, CNI that we participated in. And um, we'll give an update of where we have gotten since then. Um, and at the end, we'll discuss our approach and lessons learned in the process. Yeah, I think, wasn't it 2019 was the last time? I think so. Just before pandemic. Um, first, we want to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, we are both coming to you from uh, Southeast Michigan, and we acknowledge that the historical origins and present location of the University of Michigan were made possible by Indigenous peoples' secession of lands under co coercive treaties common in the colonization expansion of the United States. In particular, we note that the university's three campuses are located on lands of the Anishinaabe and Wyandotte, which were ceded in the Treaty of Detroit in 1807. Additionally, we recognize that the university's endowment was largely originally funded in significant measure by sale of land granted under Article 16 of the 1817 Treaty of the Foot of the Rapids, also known as the Treaty of Fort Meigs. This grant um, for the College of Detroit was made by Anishinaabe, including the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Boduwadami, so that their children could be educated. And we also recognize that the University of Michigan has not been great at adhering to this promise of educating those Indigenous children. Um, we know that acknowledgement is not enough, um, but that is a place to start. Likewise, we want to acknowledge the digital environments that make meetings like this possible. And um, this is a quote from Adrian Wong, an artist of the Spider Web show. And they ask us to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technologies, structures, and ways of thinking that we use every day. We are using equipment and high speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. This technology leaves significant carbon footprints contributing to changing climates that dispropor disproportionately affect Indigenous peoples worldwide. I invite you to join me in acknowledging all of this, as well as our shared responsibility to make good of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship. Yeah, so we wanted to kind of um, provide a little bit of context and background about the University of Michigan. Um, and uh, predominantly and historically, it's been a, a white institution, and um, we're a tier one, uh, tier top tier R one research institution. Um, and though while we have a lot of, of resources, um, they're very heavily siloed, so it's sometimes difficult to get access to them depending on where you're at in them. And um, sometimes the expectations of our faculty don't exactly align with the. the the realities um, in, with regards to digital scholarship support. Um, we're among 19 different schools and colleges, and uh, that, and then also on top of that, there we have a humongous library and a humongous uh, hospital as well. And then sprinkled throughout there is uh, 36 different uh, IT shops, and uh, they come in various sizes, from just a handful of folks in them to you know a thousand or so. Um, in those shops is very decentralized. Um, we have a very interdisciplinary kind of culture. Let me say anything, Anne. Oh, 
All right, so the University of Michigan Library, uh, which is where I work, um, is the fourth largest research library in the United States. So we're massive. There are over 20 libraries across 12 different buildings um, on our campus and more broadly. Uh, we have over 500 staff and roughly 170 librarians. Our librarians, archivists, and curators have also just recently unionized. Um, so this is a changing climate right now. Currently, we our holdings include somewhere between 14 and 15.6 million volumes, and we have a very large collections budget, including those for electronic resources, which aren't really included here. So the Digital Scholarship Service Team um, at the University of Michigan Library was established in 2019, so we're still fairly young. Um, what I have here an image of just you know, rough circles that kind of give you a sense of how our uh, teams are embedded within one each one another. So uh, I am part of the core digital scholarship hub, um, our DS hub, and there are four of us individuals um, who make up that team and we, you know, take on most of the incoming consultations, requests for uh, requests and questions, um, those early front door kinds of activities. Uh, we then have a digital scholarship advisory group, which has about 20 members, and this includes folks who are representatives from every division of our library. Apologies, that's my dog. Um, and this also includes representatives from Joe's team and LSA as well. Uh, and then we have our larger digital scholarship practitioners team, which includes about 70 individual and group experts from across the library and on campus. And we often reach out to these folks when we get very you know, discipline specific questions or ones related to specific tools, practices and methodologies. Um, and this gives you like a snapshot of the kinds of uh, structure and support we have at the U of M library around digital scholarship. Yeah, and then the uh, College of Literature, Science and Arts, which we refer to as LSA, um, it's one of the 19 schools and colleges, um, has just under 20,000 undergrad students, um, two and a half thousand uh, grad students, and about 41 different academic departments. So it's one of the bigger schools and colleges there. Um, and uh, our technology services department within LSA is comprised of departments that help with um, academic technologies, research and computing and infrastructure, uh, web applications, um, and so forth. And I'm sitting inside of the digital scholarship studio, which is inside the research team, which is inside the research computing and infrastructure services. <laughs> so like the little nested doll kind of version of things. <laughs> So last time um, at our, our at CNI, we talked about just the starting of this this relationship, this partnership between the library and LSA Technology Services, um, and we have links here, um, which we'll we'll share if you're following along the slides. It's accessible. Um, we shared some of the values that were guiding this work, um, where we were getting a lot of our you know forming our principles. Uh, also, that kind of mesh net matrix network structure that um, provides a, a flexible, resilient uh, architecture for like how we relate to one another. And then just, you know, general uh, summary of our capacity where we're at institutionally in terms of digital scholarship support. Yeah, and so to that and um, the last time we, we gave an update, we saw this is a framework that um, we got from um, literature um and it's they 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 pulled it into like an early stage capacity uh, capability established stage and a high capacity stage and you can see in the bullet points there um just some of those uh elements of what makes up those different stages and last time we were thinking eh, we're somewhere kind of in the early stage we've got a few things that are kind of seeping into established stage and I think now when we look at and evaluate ourselves, we're looking at, yeah, we're pretty well in the established stage now. Um, so that means that we're doing, um, we have a lot more process in, involved with things. Um, we have institutional champions. We have formal commitments of resources. Um, and we mean that like budgetarily and also like staff wise. Um, and then, uh, you know, 
recognition generally that uh, decisions and priorities benefit from coordination and so forth. We're, I think, and we're seeing a little bit of us um, starting to look at or get into the high capacity elements, some of them. Mm -hmm. you want to talk yeah, because I think um, so I should say that within the library, at least our digital scholarship service is in its second or it's completing its second year of a three year pilot. So this next year will be spent um, doing a lot of assessment about how the last two years have gone and the adjustments that we need to make. Um, so we do have commitments from each of our, our units, the library and LSA um, in terms of resources, but at this stage, they are still fairly limited um, because we're we're testing things out. Um, we are, I think we're at that point now where we're looking forward to moving into the high capacity stage. We're putting together proposals and working to, you know, concretize some of these things that have been more informal over the last couple of years. Right. Mm -hmm. So in developing our digital scholarship service pilot, we did have some clear goals uh, that, was, that were guiding this work. The first was that we wanted to be guided by our values and our principles. So of course we had to create those. Um, now we have publicly on our digital scholarship pages um, on the U of M library website, we have principles that guide our work. Um, and we are very serious about these. So all of the initiatives and programs that we offer, we refer back to these. So if we're accepting applications, for example, for our pilot anti-racism digital research initiative, like we ask people to actually address how their work aligns with our principles. And we bring these principles into our consultations and how to how we work with each other. Um, they are woven into how we work on a daily basis. We also wanted to make sure that we met the needs of our campus community and an institution of this size, it's really challenging to get a sense of what their needs are. Um, Joe works within a very large college, but there are many other colleges um, that we know folks are doing digital scholarship in those spaces. Uh, we also know people don't tend to answer surveys. So trying to figure out ways to assess those needs um, and to try to meet them. At the same time, as I mentioned, we do have some commitments of resources. Um, most of that is in the form of staffing and personnel. We don't have a ton of infrastructure. And in the library, we have very little in terms of technological infrastructures that we can offer for faculty members in terms of like building their projects or sustaining them. And the library's mission is a little bit different from that of an IT shop, um, very much about access, preservation. Uh, so. Those are a little bit different. So figuring out how we can use the infrastructure, the technologies that are available to us to provide you know, new services. At the same time, we wanna recognize that our staff have limited capacity and we want to be able to respect those and you know, protect those folks. This has been especially important um, during the pandemic when our work changed dramatically. Um, so we'll, we'll speak a little bit about how we've transitioned. Yeah, and uh, one of the things that is is emphasized a lot is this importance of relationships and sort of interdependence as well. Um, so, you know, creating those relationships with staff, with services elsewhere on campus, um, and just kind of being transparent with communication, being equitable with labor as much as possible, having mutual respect, and you know, centering on collaboration and partnership. Another thing that I think we've been working uh, on is like consentful relationships. So not just you know, throwing stuff at people, but you know, making sure that the, that, that kind of consent is there. And also, I think we've been looking at um, the inherent kinds of um, either power or social dynamics that are in, implicit in many of these relationships that aren't necessarily unique to just the University of Michigan, but you know, inherent within higher ed and structures in general, and just trying to figure out how exactly to address those as well, when we're thinking about the importance of relationships. And so, <laughs> I don't know, this is a, a doodle of my whiteboard, which you can see in the background here. So we were kind of like, how do we make this stuff work? So it's, it's fine and well to just kind of talk about it in theory, but then when you actually have to 
do it. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, you, you start running into things that are, are, are tough logistically. So there's a lots of overlap. There's lots of areas where like one team or group does one thing, another does another thing. Sometimes we have different incentivizations, um, different things that are important to us. Um, sometimes our management or leadership don't always agree. So yeah, that, this is kind of like the, the actual content of this picture is not as important as just seeing that we have like a lot of stuff sprawled out and it's messy and it overlaps and <laughs> converges and diverges and so forth. I don't know, Andy, do you want to add anything to that? I think it's a great peek into just the messiness of doing institutional collaborations. There's a lot of overlapping Venn diagram circles, um, and you can see that here, digital scholarship at UMICH, and we have it broken down to the DS Studio and LSA, the DS Hub and the library, maybe library IT, and then potentially other partners and how and when we bring those in. Um, it's still a work in progress, and it's, yeah, it's messy, but mm -hmm. it's also a joy to do this work. Ah, I'm moving through slides too fast. There we go. <laughs> um, so we do have like um, over the you know development of this pilot, we've identified what our core services are in in the digital scholarship space. Um, our primary one is consultations. We do a lot of one on one and team based consultations with researchers, research projects, um, and a lot of these are just getting folks to cons like consider best approaches to answering their research questions, the tools that might be necessary, the skills they need to learn, people that they need to talk to to acquire those skills, et cetera, or even access to data. Um, we host also a lot of workshops, and increasingly more and more of these workshops are being offered um, in collaboration with LSA and with other partners. So we are having, we're hosting co-hosted workshops, co-facilitated workshops. Um, and we're also scaffolding them. So we're starting with like conceptualizing your digital project, um, starting with, you know, very early considerations, how you plan to manage your data, how you plan for preservation and sunsetting. Um, and then we, we bring in other folks and expertise over the course of the year. Uh, together, we also host quite a few public events. Um, so we have a series called Demystifying Digital Scholarship, where we bring in expert speakers from out off, off campus to come and talk about specific things. So we've had people come and talk about text mining, for example, or, you know, sensitive approaches to addressing to digital archival practices. Um, and we also host more local events like our Art and Feminism Wikipedia Editathon on our Douglas Day um, transcription events. And these have been really great for just bringing together communities of folks who are interested in doing critical digital work. Um, Jill, you want to talk about the networking events? Yeah, so um, kind of woven into all these different events are areas and opportunities for folks to get together um, from different areas and different roles. So scholars together um, as like a cohort um, or students and scholars or you know support partners and so forth and so on. So everybody can kind of just cohere this sort of like community um, that's you know that's really nice to see. Um, we also have some focused research support sprints, which um, sometimes I think they're called scholar sprints um, from the library. And um, this is where we can sit people down with a very specific issue that they're just having, you know, a hurdle they need to, to go across and do an intensive kind of like research cons consultation with them. Um, we also have open office hours um, where many of us get together and just hang out on Zoom and and folks come and ask questions or they just hang out and and talk with us about like what their thoughts are on on various projects and what they're thinking about doing. Um, we also have exciting for um, that started this year is a certificate program. Um, and and do you want to talk a little more about that one? Sure. Yeah. So um, with our partners in LSA and liaisons in library, we have a certificate program. This is non-curricular um, and it's uh, structured around a series of workshops that we offer our digital scholarship 101 uh, workshops. And this is designed for graduate students um, to be able to complete in the space of one to two years. It's supposed to supplement other more curricular graduate certificates um, or graduate programs. 
And it, you know, we have a cohort of 10 students who are going through this program with us um, and we're iterating it as we go. And that's been really, really great. Um, and lastly, this, this past year, and we're in the middle of it right now, we've been piloting an anti-racist digital re grant initiative. Um, and we took in, I think we received something like 33 applications from faculty, students, postdocs all over campus um, in almost every college, I think. And we ended up funding six projects. Many of them are community related. We have contingent faculty, tenure track faculty, graduate students um, working with partners in the community to address you know, research questions around anti-racist approaches historically, addressing it, racism. Um, and we're learning a lot um, as we as we are uh, supporting this cohort of researchers. So we'll be, I think we have another six months um, in this cycle, and then we'll be assessing this before we, you know, try it again. Yeah. So we talked earlier about how our values uh, can guide the principles and how we weave them into a lot of things. This is a bullet point list of all of the different values that we've come up with that we we want to embed into our activities, actions, and what we do. Um, and this was uh, literally co-created with all of the members. So bringing in that consentfulness as well to this. Um, and down below is a link to the source, which has a whole lot more description behind each of these. I don't think we have enough time to go through each of these in, in a lot of detail, because um, that would be a whole presentation on its own, <laughs> uh, which might be a good idea. Um, but I do want to point out um, how a lot of these relate to each other and how um, at least uh, from an LSA perspective, from coming from a technology uh, support perspective, we use these in and try to apply these and aspire to uh, live up to these um, with everything that we do from uh, how we frame and work through our consultations to how we decide and choose which um, platforms and technologies to use to how we architect solutions um, and like thinking of through like who makes decisions on these and how they make the decisions and so forth. And did you want to? Yeah, and I can say that. So these, um, the you can see the full descriptions on uh, the library website. We link to that here. But we spent quite a bit of time um, developing these principles and then also revisiting them. So like the anti-racism principle uh, is new, um, and we developed that um, since two that. 2020, um, which probably is, is not a surprise. Um, and we've worked with our accessibility specialists, for example, to develop that principle. So we take a very um, disability justice approach to how we do this work. Um, and I think all of these are, are really important considering the kinds of uh, capacity limits uh, that we have in terms of like knowing that we can't say yes to everything. Um, and this allows us a, a principled way of approaching how we make decisions. Um, yeah. So I will say that um, Adrienne Marie Brown's Emergent Strategy, which was published in 2017, was very influential for us as we were developing our service um, and thinking about our roles within, within these structures. Uh, Adrienne Marie Brown is a, an, an artist activist out of, based out of Detroit. We have her the cover of her book here. Um, and one of the things that she has said is that all organizing is science fictional behavior. And I think Joe and I, um, what we've tried to do is imagine like our ideal digital scholarship service um, and try to build that from within the institution with, you know, a lot of this is grassroots um, and we're really lucky that we have, you know, administrators and supervisors who have supported this work. But we have also tried to, you know, implement the, uh, principles that Adrienne Marie Brown has has laid out and we try to be adaptive. We also try to shape the change that we want to see. And then also like the pandemic has shown us like the you know union contracts right now, we have to be able to be flexible and ride the change. Sometimes we can't anticipate it. But we have to be able to move along with it. Um, so 
we highly recommend checking out emergent strategy and, and also thinking intentionally about like how you adapt that and what that means to you in your work, because this might not be appropriate for everyone. So I'll just yeah. leave that there. One of the principles that really stuck with me um, from from uh, Adrian Marie Brown's work was the moving at the speed of trust, which I think we've seen happen and and it has implications in that when you do that, then what you end up co-creating is more sturdy and dependable and reliable. Um, but also it means that sometimes you go down a path and it just doesn't work. So you have to kind of make decisions accordingly. So that's right. And that often means moving really slowly as well. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so one of the major things that we've we've learned is just the importance of placing people first. Um, and as as just as Joe was just saying, um, we focus really hard on relationships. Um, we want to trust in people, the people that are there, trust in their expertise and their knowledge and their experience um, because they are bringing a lot to the space. One of the things that Adrian Murray Brown says is um, there is a conversation that is happening in this room that can only happen with the people that are in this room. So making sure that you, you know, um, can pull out the work that can happen by whoever is present to do that work. So we're really lucky in the library here, we have four, F, uh, and I think the next slide is about staffing, um, four people who are committed to doing digital scholarship work, um, and that's written into their job descriptions. And that's really a luxury. Um, and even then we, we feel, right, um, pressures because we can't do everything. Yeah, and so in LSA Technology Services, um, we have a slightly different approach where we've got about three, almost four FTE uh, full-time employees worth of time, but it's spread out over about a dozen folks. Um, and so we have roles, uh, everything from like a strategist to research consultants, to designers, design analysts, developers, and systems administrators. Yeah, and I think yeah. one of the things we wanted to say too is um, aligning this work uh, across these folks together collectively, but um, aligning it with our mission and our goals and our principles and setting those goals together. So yeah, lessons learned. Invest in people. People are the most important thing. Uh, the services would not exist um, if we had a beautiful space and not the right people to do that work. We also believe very heavily uh, in strongly in pilots um, and piloting initiatives first, and also taking the necessary time to revisit and assess and iterate. Um, for example, with the anti-racism digital research initiative, we're learning that I think um, faculty need a lot of assistance in areas that we hadn't anticipated. Um, we had a lot of plans on how to get them the technical support they need, but they needed a lot of help with project management. Um, so we've been, you know, uh, very flexible in trying to figure out ways to accommodate these needs. But next time around, we know what we will start with the project management support um, and build that into the program. Yeah, so be willing to try things and to adapt. Yeah, and then along those lines, you know, not getting too attached to anything because as you try and pilot things out, test things, experiment on things, sometimes they don't work. And so you either have to change them so drastically that they don't look quite like what they used to, but they're much more uh, useful or it just goes away. Um, and so we just carry on with something else instead. Um, and I think we mentioned this earlier, but be comfortable moving slowly at that speed of trust. Um, and, uh, you know, thinking really creatively about the resources that you have access to. Um, we've heard from our leadership and management often um, that, you know, they're surprised at how much work and how much output that this team is able to put out. And I think it's because we, we very much, you know, look at all of the different resources we have um, and just think creatively about how we're able to approach things and use what we've got already. And sometimes it's like, reusing things and, and making sure that you can, you know, repurpose one workshop for multiple initiatives or something like that. Along those lines. Yeah, and on the library side of things, we know that our strength is very much in consultation um, and having that subject area expertise and also 
you know, having practical expertise, but we don't have like the technological capacity to build things for faculty members. And that's why the partnership with LSA has been so fruitful. Um, and we can really lean on each other for various things. And I think a lot of the projects that have been very successful have included, you know, representatives from both the library and LSA. And I think this is um, a, a really great example of like the library doesn't need to be doing all of the things and we can partner with with others on campus to provide necessary services for our researchers yeah and so we want to thank you for watching this uh presentation and if you want to get in touch with us we have an email uh down below yep. thanks library-ds at umich.edu yep. all right thank you <laughs>